So in this lecture, I want to look at one of my favorite um, chemical processes that involves uh, the formation of urea. So first of all, we have to get to um, just, just briefly touch on the Fritz-Haber process. So the Fritz-Haber process is a form of, uh, or it's a process. So it's a little bit more complicated than a reaction. It's a series of reactions, chemical process for the um, synthesis of um, NH3 from N2. Um, so, gosh, I think it's just Fritz. It's the Fritz-Haber-Bosch process. So um, I'm gonna call this Fritz-Haber's process and it's the Haber-Bosch process, I believe. I believe there's a second scientist. So sorry for not having this right. Um, really important reaction. Uh, nitrogen is the main component of the air that we um, inhale. Uh, obviously it's the oxygen that we're after, but uh, nitrogen makes up the majority of our atmosphere. And NH3 is used in fertilizers quite a bit. And so biology's figured out several mechanisms for fixing nitrogen gas from the atmosphere. A very uh, thermodynamically stable molecule, it's difficult to get access to it and use it into something that's a little bit more um, uh, useful. Whereas NH3 is very useful, very reactive, easy to kind of incorporate into molecules and provides the nitrogen source for all the food that we eat. So Fritz Haber developed this process, apparently with Bosch, um, and it really kind of saved the world at the time. This was, uh, pre-World War One, pre-World War One, I, I believe. And so um, popul the population in the world was getting so high that we weren't able to accommodate that population with our food production, our agriculture production, um, until Fritz Haber basically saved the world from um, global like hunger, I guess, um, by uh, figuring out how to produce NH3, which led to the, to the rapid production of fertilizers, which really enhanced our agricultural production so that we could feed the world. So in this respect, Fritz Haber was a hero. And then shortly thereafter, he became a, a, a sort of, sort of a, a German um, war scientist uh, and really focused on weapon production using chemistry and was the uh, probably the father of modern chemical warfare. So went from a hero on one hand to probably an arch villain on the other hand and just the sequence of a few years. It was particularly, um, and he held that post, I think, into Nazi Germany time. And um, what was particularly unsettling about all of it was he was a, um, a, a German a Jewish man that sort of betrayed his family through it all. I think his wife ended up committing suicide and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, anyway, tough story. But uh, the, the, the process for producing ammonia is super important. Now, one thing that ammonia can be used for is the, in, is the industrial synthesis of urea. This is one of my favorite industrial processes. Now, what we do is we take NH3 plus CO2, we apply high heat and pressure high heat and high pressure, and we form urea. Now urea is a nice food source for plants. So it feeds plants and enhances agriculture. And in fact, urea is a, um, a component of urine. And so you may notice that like if animals urinate frequently in patches of grass on people's lawns or something like when people let their dogs out, you have a thicker, um, lusher growing grass where uh, uh, in their favorite spots in the lawn to urinate and it's because um, you're kind of feeding the plants um, a bunch of uh, urea and so there's a bunch of like interesting I, I'll, I'll use that I'll use that phrase interesting kind of approaches to home gardening um, that involve uh, adding urea from urine anyway so this is a uh, urea from urine is not sustainable. But urea from NH3 and carbon dioxide becomes uh, a, a very feasible process route for, your, um, for making urea and for making fertilizers by this process. Now, the way the reaction works 
is um, we can consider this mechanistically. And then I wanna speak a little bit about the industrial process itself. So the mechanism is we're going to take CO2 and instead of considering it as this thermodynamically stable gas that has three atoms, so it's a greenhouse gas and it's becoming a burden for our atmosphere. Let's think for a moment about its reaction with ammonia. So ammonia is an amine without any substituents. So it's just ammonia. And we can add that directly to the carbonyl carbon of CO2. It turns out there are two carbonyl carbons. And we get this adduct that can lose hydrogen and then pick up hydrogen. to make this species. So this is the product from addition of ammonia to carbon dioxide, but we can actually add another ammonia to this where the lone pair again engages the carbonyl carbon. to get another charged species, a charge separated species, it's vitrionic, I guess I should say, where we can lose hydrogen and then pick up hydrogen We're going to pick up hydrogen at this OH just to get right to the products here. That's going to render our H2O as a good leaving group. It could be the case that the oxygen with a negative charge picks up the hydrogen first, but we ultimately have to lose that hydrogen. So accounting for the product formation by way of this intermediate doesn't bother me too much. Okay, so after the oxygen becomes protonated with two hydrogens, it becomes a good leaving group. The oxygen with a negative charge can come can push the electrons down to reform a carbon oxygen double bond in the product and establish the formation of our urea. Turns out that the urea, urea was first synthesized in 1812 um, from an inorganic source. Before that, it was thought that all organic molecules had to come from biology. And so it was when Frederick Wohler synthesized this organic molecule from non-biological ultimate from from what appeared to be I mean from non-biological sources I won't complicate things right um, from non-biological sources he proved that um, organic molecules the molecules that were produced in the in the human body and in other bodies any other types of biology um, could be produced without making without involving a living organism and that kind of put to rest the idea of vitalism, which was kind of how organic chemistry was first formed. It was thinking that all these molecules were produced using a vitalistic or divine force directly. And here we show that it's all just kind of chemistry and the divine forces are, um, uh, I'll just say more complicated. <laughs> well, I, don't, I won't get into it. Okay. Anyway, so cool molecule um, feeds the world, feeds the plants, that sort of thing made by this industrial process. I really like this industrial process. I've looked into this. Um, this is a big process in a lot of parts of the world, in particular Australia, where they have giant tanks that they fill up with carbon dioxide and ammonia, and they apply a lot of heat and pressure. And what they do is they watch as urea, a solid, forms on the sides of their plant vessels their, their, um, their uh, reactor vessels, I'll, I'll say, the plant as though a process plant, not like a, a, a something with a stock and leaves. Okay, so their reactor, this giant reactor full of high pressure CO2 and ammonia starts to form water and urea. The water stays um, kind of mixed in the, app, in, the, uh, in, the, in the gas phase or the supercritical phase, um, but the urea forms a solid on the sides of the reactor. So they let the reaction occur and they let urea build up on the walls of the reactor. And then what they do is they say the reaction's done. Now what they could do is just open up their tank and release a bunch of waste, but that would be problematic because CO2 content in the atmosphere is at a problematic high level and we're producing more and more of it. So instead what they do is they just connect the reactor to another reactor. They push all of the volatile substances, the fluid-like substances out 
that's the water that was produced as a byproduct of the reaction, the ammonia and the carbon dioxide into a clean reactor, put that under high pressure and heat and make more urea on the sides of their other reactor. So what do they do with the first reactor? Well, they go in and they scrub it um, free of the urea. They just scrub the urea off the sides. So the CO2 and the ammonia bounce back and forth until the pressure of the CO2 and the ammonia has been consumed so much that they have to refill the tanks. Thus, they're not providing any CO2 byproducts for the atmosphere, and they're producing a huge amount of this precious resource, which is urea. As a result, urea production is sustainable, and it's actually not the worst chemical, I won't say it's good for the, the environment, but in terms of um, its balance of being good for human, um, for the quality of life of humans and its impact on the environment, it is in a very favorable um, spot in terms of industrial processes. And one that I'm a big fan of, anything that uses CO2 as a chemical building block and leads to its, um, and does so efficiently without producing CO2 waste, that's definitely a win in my book. So with that, I'll end this lecture. We'll move into more um, traditional reactions of amides in the subsequent lecture, in the next lecture, I should say.